might possibly have in common with Bill Gates, Queen Elizabeth, Steve Jobs, and Richard Branson. Any ideas? It's not their paycheck, and it's not their bank balance. I wish it had been. And what on earth do they have in common with the founders of organizations that we all live for? WhatsApp, Facebook, Disney, Dell, and for me, Chanel, which I wish this was, but it's not. Any ideas? Well, we're part of a club of people that either didn't graduate high school or didn't graduate college. And I'm so proud to be part of that exclusive club. It taught me so much about never giving up. So which way do these people look at the glass? How do you look at the glass? Is it half full or half empty? How did these three iconic people in history look at the glass? They were all born into extreme poverty and have gone down for generations as some of the most iconic people who have touched millions and millions around the world. Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, and Gandhi. I have to believe they led their life not looking down, but looking up, saying, this challenge is my opportunity to go out there, to touch people, and make a difference. I am not giving up. I am looking at that glass half full. Well, guess what? I look at the glass half full. How else could I end up, have ended up at working at companies including ABC, Yahoo, NBC, and CBS? Well, as any good storyteller will tell you, you have to believe in fairy tales. And guess what? I do. It's the fairy tale princess, Princess Diana. So I'm from California, my mother's English, and she came up with this great idea of shipping me off to boarding school when I was 10 years old. So I left the sunny climates of San Francisco and the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge and ended up in a British boarding school surrounded by rain, sheep, and too many fields that I cared to count. It was not a terrific time, I have to say. Anyway, soon it was half term, and I was shipped off to my grandmother in London. And what did she have planned? Nothing fun, but a trip to the hair salon. I thought, oh my goodness, I'd rather have stayed with those sheep back in, at school. <laughs> anyway, we walked into the hair salon, and the only other peop there was one other woman there. And she had things in her hair I had never seen before before, tin foil. And the girl was young and she was laughing and I was fascinated. It was more interesting than seeing my grandmother with rollers under the dryer. All of a sudden, somebody came in to talk to this woman with the foil in her hair with a big bag from Harrods. I'm like, finally, I hope my grandmother's gonna take me to Harrods after this miserable hair salon experience. Anyway, out comes this blue skirt and a blue jacket and this woman with the foil is still laughing, showing people my grandmother said, come here, come here. Do you know who that is? I said, why would I know who that is? I want to know what's in her hair. <laughs> she says to me, that's Lady Diana Spencer. It's Prince Charles's girlfriend. I was like, so? I mean, I'm from California. I want to know, like, who's the latest movie star in Hollywood? I wasn't really that interested in the British royal family. Excuse me, your majesty. The next day, I was being shipped back to my boarding school. And there was a Charing Cross station, the Evening Standard, and the front page was Prince Charles is engaged to Lady Diana Spencer. And that woman with the foil in her hair was getting her color done. Blondes have more fun. <laughs> and the blue suit was her engagement suit on the stairs of Buckingham Palace. I was hooked. I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, I was obsessed at age 11 with reading everything and anything about Diana. I didn't care about my schoolwork. I threw it all out of the window, but I had to read everything, every newspaper, every publication. I asked for magazines from around the world, and all of a sudden, my curiosity about life, politics, geography was my calling, which was just as well because one day my mother got a call to say, please come down, your daughter's not doing so great. My mother's like, what have you done? I said, well, I don't know. I mean, and I really was working hard. I was making grade Cs. I always thought I was going to get the grade A. They're like, hello, but you know, your daughter's never going to make it. So please don't waste our time and your money. And please take her from here. 
I was like, hallelujah, I'm done with the rain, I want to go back to California, and I want to be a journalist. My dad pushed and pushed and pushed, and I finally got into a college called Pepperdine University, which, by the way, I got a degree and a suntan, it's based in Malibu, California, so it could have been worse. <laughs> I worked really, really hard. I followed my passion for journalism, and when I graduated, I came back to London. And in the spirit of never giving up, I called every single bureau chief of every network, ABC, NBC, and CBS, until the bureau chief of ABC News said to me, you are so annoying, will you just go away and I'll give you a job, come and serve coffee. I'm like, great, I'm there. Three days later, I got sent to Berlin. It was the night the Berlin Wall fell. That started an incredible journey for me. I've covered so many stories, the collapse of communism, the release of Nelson Mandela, some tragic events, including 9-11, historical events, including the inauguration of the first African-American president of the United States. And I've been to many destinations more than one time for good times and bad times, outside Westminster Abbey for the funeral of Princess Diana, outside Westminster Abbey, for the wedding of her son, Prince William. I've covered a few too many wars. My time in West Bank and Gaza has had an enormous impact on me. Oh, there we are. <laughs> uh, I've met a lot of people along the way. Uh, I thought I'd share a few of them with you because listen, none of these people were born knowing what they were doing. But they ended up becoming people because they didn't give up on what they wanted to do. I met Yasser Arafat more times than I could even count. A lot of heads of state, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, this was shortly after 9-11 in Jeddah, King Abdullah of Jordan, Queen Noor, this was uh, shortly after King Hussein died. And a lot of uh, US presidents, President Clinton, President Bush. And then a couple of movie stars, which um, I've always found a challenge, but I thought I'd tell you a few little anecdotes about them. Uh, Barbara Streisand calling my edit room to say, Niccolo, which picture do you think I look the best in? She just got married. And I was like, Barbara Streisand's calling me to say, hey, which is my best wedding photo? Eric Clapton and Al Pacino. Al Pacino's really interesting. I mean, here's a man who's in The Godfather, and he's calling me at home on a Sunday night saying, I am too nervous to do my interview tomorrow. I'm like, didn't you play, aren't you in The Godfather? Why are you calling me? It's Sunday at 7. I'm ordering Chinese food. This is going to be fine. But I want all these people that I've referenced so far, they weren't born being successful, and I'm sure the majority of them never thought that they could do it. But they did, and they didn't give up. In competitive fields, they made it. I owe so much of my success to somebody I'm proud to call my friend. Her name is Katie Couric. She's an American journalist. In fact, we're outside Westminster Abbey. I I think that was for William's wedding, but I honestly don't remember. Um, Katie taught me a lot about compassion and also not giving up. She lost her husband at age 42, leaving her with two young children. But rather than look at the glass half empty, she looked at it as half full. She said, I lost my husband to colon cancer within nine months, but I'm not going to let the agony of what I've gone through and the lack of understanding about this most cruel disease go unnoticed. She, followed, she founded an organization to, called Stand Up to Cancer. It's raised hundreds of millions of dollars. It has Nobel laureates on its board, and it's made a huge impact in the advancement of cancer care and treatment. I was now sort of nearing about 18 or 20 years in the business, and I just thought, you know what? I've got to do better. I want to give back. And now I want to help people that are less fortunate. So I got really into philanthropy, a passion that I love. Transitioning out of journalism into philanthropy was a huge challenge. I made a lot of mistakes on the way, and I'm so glad I made mistakes. I'm so glad it was difficult for me. Because to all of you, challenges only make us stronger. Don't be scared to make a mistake. If you make a mistake, it's OK. We're all human. I ended up doing some really rewarding work 
representing women in countries, war-torn countries, for the opportunity for a microfinance loan. I will never forget the joy on women in Liberia when we gave them wheelbarrows to carry their crops rather than on their backs. I'll never forget teaching women in Tanzania about land rights. I was fortunate enough to represent and work with Prince Charles on his organization for empowerment in Afghanistan. So during my times of challenges, there's a quote that I often read to myself. If you can't fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you must keep moving forward. I don't think anyone epitomizes the moving forward spirit more than my all-time hero. She's the youngest Nobel laureate in the history of the Peace Prize. And out of everybody that I've met, and I get always asked, who's your favorite person? Who's the most interesting? It's a 15-year-old girl who's got shot only because she wanted the right to an education. Not only did she get shot and fight for her life, she fought for her life with compassion, she got her education, and she looked at that glass half full when she could have given up. And she said, I'm gonna go out and make a difference. Her name is Malala. And I always get emotional talking about her because she really is the epitome of seeing the glass half full. In pink, my favorite color. <laughs> so what I want to say to all of you is, Never judge a book by its cover. We all struggle. We all wish that we could have something or be something that maybe we're not. Life is full of peaks and valleys, but climb that mountain. No matter how tough it is, please don't give up. Take that next step, because when you reach that peak, it's so worth it. And please, do it kindly. Do it with compassion. Please look at everybody that you meet. Every opinion counts. Just because somebody has a big title, it doesn't mean it's the best opinion. Be humble, be kind, build a team. We're all in life together. And in closing, I'd like to pull another quote that I think, I hope you'll all remember tonight. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Please, don't give up. Life is worth it. Thank you.